Well, it was an exciting game to watch for the neutral, and it certainly was a game of two halves. But statistics can be misleading at times. You'd be forgiven if you thought, looking at the general statistics of territory and possession, that Wales had won the game. Wales had dominated in these areas, particularly in the second half. But the overriding statistic for me was that the Irish team actually scored all of their 30 points in the first 44 minutes of the game. In a pulsating game, the ball was in play quite a long time, over 41 minutes. But if you look at the difference between the teams and how long they had with the ball, Ireland only actually had the ball for just over 12 minutes. But it's not how long you have the ball, it's actually what you do with it that counts. And technically and tactically, the Irish team were far better on the day, especially first half. Let's take a little look. When the Irish team carried the ball, they invariably carried the ball over the line and presented it long, getting it back for Conor Murray to present quick ball. Take a look at Jamie Heaslip here. He's very concerned with placing the ball right back there for his scrum half so that they can play the ball on the hoof. Contrast Wales, Toby Falatel in his stomach, squeezing the ball out, allowing them to cage the ball in and a second man to get over the ball and slow it up and in many, often times, turning the ball over. For Wales, this happened and frustratingly in the opposition's 22. Here, a good carry by Andrew Coombs, who had a good carrying game, but Ian Evans in support goes off his feet, he goes high to low, doesn't take out the threat and when Justin Tipperick comes to clean up a mess, he's too late and Kean Healy gets yet another turnover ball. It was the story of the day. But who was leading? Where did the leadership come from? Here we have a free kick from a scrum in an attacking position. Ian Evans decides to carry it up. He's too high, the support is too late, and yet again, Ireland come away with a ball with Conor Murray. The choke tackle has been well documented here, Matthew Rees going in. If you're too high, three defenders will come in, envelop the ball carrier on the ball, keep it off the floor, and when the ensuing mall collapses to the ground and the ball can't be seen, the referee has no question but to turn the ball over to the opposition. Now this Irish team came in very confident mood, but they were also tactically very smart. And Wales, well, they're a little bit predictable at times. And again, highlighted with some line-out deficiencies. Let's take a look. When we got the ball into their half, we lost crucial line-outs. There was miscommunication between the line-out caller and the thrower. And when we got into that vital killer zone we needed to secure a ball, we lost possession. In the outside channels, there were uncharacteristic attacking errors from the likes of Jonathan Davis. In contrast, Ireland came smart and cute at the line-out, varying their play, getting it into the outside channels and the quicker guys. Changing up their delivery here, using a back peel and Conor Murray, who was prominent throughout the game. And when the master got it in his hands, out in the wide channels, he showed his experience and deft talent, and just to remind the Lion selectors that he's still about. Now, Wales came very, very hard in the second half, and particularly in the battle of the back rows and the carries, it highlighted some significant differences. In terms of yardage, they carried roughly the same, but the Irish back row carried over the gain line in less carries than the Welsh contingent. From a Welsh point of view, when the two number sevens were on the field, here's a stark contrast. Eight carries from Sam Orbiton for five metres, but when the influential Justin Tipperick came on, for only five carries, 26 metres, and the game changed up slightly. Wales battered and battered the Irish defence towards the end, and in contrast to Wales tackles, Ireland had to make a really demanding 200 tackles. But I'll leave the panel with this question. Was the result down to some great Irish defence, or was it predictable poor Wales attack? Well, not one of the classic games, but you cannot put statistics on heart, commitment and attitude. Wales had this in abundance yesterday. It's been nine games since we shut out the opposition and not conceded a try. We had it yesterday. It was a great defensive effort, typified by the effort of the two second rows. Ian Evans and Andrew Coombs totaling 27 tackles between them. But it was a kicking display and a tactical one at that that really paid dividends for Wales as well. If we look at the open play kicks, 27 for a 52% territory. A reference for you back in 2005 when we won 30 kicks for 40% territory. Let's take a look. The Wales players shared the load. Jonathan Davis and the players identifying early on some space behind the French back line. Mike Phillips kicked well from the base. Again, identifying that the back three was out of position and getting some territory for his team. Again, Lee Halfpenny clearing the lines, taking Wales into the French half so they have an exit line out, relieving the pressure, improving the territory stats. And this manifested itself ultimately in the crucial moment where Dan Bigger identified the space again and George North took his opportunity. It was a very disjointed game and both teams seemed afraid to lose it, but the pitch and the referee didn't help either. 
If we take a look at the ball in playtime, again, over 40 minutes, but eight minutes surrounded the scrum time. There were actually 16 scrums, 11 of which yielded penalties or free kicks and a frustrating afternoon. I don't think Adam Jones will have George Clancy on his Christmas list much longer. Four penalties by the Wales tight end in this one game. Wales have built a reputation on a strong scrum, and Adam Jones in particular, and the pitch didn't help with him losing his feet. Time and time again, he was deemed to infringe on the tight head side by Mr Clancy, and it was a very frustrating afternoon for the Wales tight head prop. France seemed to lack rhythm, ideas and leadership, but Wales weren't short in this department. You can't keep this man Ryan Jones down. He's so versatile, he's used in the line-out and also as a ball carrier. He's a talisman for Wales when he plays in the red shirt. He was in the forefront of everything, even grappling with the French guys off the ball and even kicking the ball for territory when he found himself in midfield. Ryan Jones typified the Welsh effort and when it came down to the final moments, he again found himself as nuisance value, time and time again, turning the ball over and ripping it from the French in this case. My first poser for the panel tonight is, were the French indifferent? Do they have tactical issues? Or did Wales really stop them playing yesterday? It's two wins from two now, and both away from home. And it was another solid and clinical performance from Wales. The defence again was magnificent. And if we look at some of the stats, Wales have now only conceded 15 points in the last 200 minutes of play. And no tries in that. In the previous 200 minutes, they've conceded as much as 80 points. It was a big kicking game, 75 kicks in yesterday's game, the most in the Six Nations so far. But Wales had a clear game plan to pressurise the Italian kickers. Just take a look at the forwards here, really putting the pressure on the likes of Burden. In this instance, he's kicking the ball out on the full and Wales get the turnover further up the field. Really applying lots of pressure, forcing errors. Watch Gethin Jenkins, not content with chasing him down once. He gets on the short side, he pressurises the scrum half box kick and they get yet another turnover high in territory. This resulting in three points for Wales. Justin Tiprick putting his body on the line, forcing Burden to miss the drop goal. A swing, no points there. And look at this attitude and determination from Gethin. Jenkins chasing the kicks down. Now, Italy are normally tricky customers at the scrum, but it was a great day at the office for the Welsh front rowers in particular. Credit to them all, especially the hookers and Richard Hibbard, who really helps Adam out in this area. Adam was world class. And it forced Italy into six penalties and free kicks at the scrum. And when you've got the likes of Lee Halfpenny kicking at an 87% success rate so far in the Six Nations, you've got to watch out. Now, usually the Italian scrummage square, but Castro Giovanni and Lo Cicero went all individual. Castro Giovanni on the angle, likewise Lo Cicero. This has the net result of splitting the second rows. And in this instance, they go down, they lose their purchase, and just watch where Wales finish up. Adam and Co coming through square and straight, and it's a penalty. Again, the pressure really, really told. Castro Giovanni going right in on the angle. And, you know, I just want you to watch the Wales front row and how the scrum ends up, because their mantra is to go really square, go through, sheer out, and then finish in this position, leaving the referee no alternative. Number three, yellow card, and that cost his team. Well, there's usually a lot of discussion about the halfbacks in Wales, and these two are certainly doing their bit for their team at the moment. A little bit under the radar, carrying and kicking the ball really well. And Dan Bigger, well, he's doing the things that he wouldn't normally expect. Here, putting Cuthbert away in the first half for the one bit of light before half time. Second half, just after, he rescues his team with a try saving tackle. Desperate work from the fly half. He's doing the normal nuts and bolts things, but when he puts the ball up in the air, watch him on the floor scavenging. He creates the turnover that when Mike Phillips puts the box, kick in Jonathan Davis gets Wales his first try excellent play from the fly half and just to sum it up exactly like the island game pulling Alex Cuthbert in with a little bit of help from Jonathan Davis on the block and Cuthbert sees that Christopher Burton moved from 10 to 15 in the defensive line takes him on and gets Wales his final try to seal the game in the corner well not the greatest of games but Wales got the job done and it certainly sets up next week Coaches rarely get the plaudits for wins, but Rob Howley has to take the credit for leading Wales to three away wins on the trot, the first time since 2009. He also has credit for the selection this week. A bold coach changes his team when the team is winning. And these two selections proved inspirational this week. Alan Wynne jones quickly back to his best, and Sam Warburton put in a man-of-the-match performance. You'd be forgiven if you wanted your match ticket money back yesterday because referee Craig Joubert blew for 25 penalties. 10 of the 13 scrums in the game resulted in a penalty or a free kick. 
resulting in 18 shots a goal. A world record for a test match, netting 39 points from the boot. Again, a Six Nations record. That meant that the ball in playtime was very, very low. It's been over 40 minutes, but 31 minutes yesterday in a turgid encounter. But Wales had a clear game plan. They wanted to go very direct at the Scottish defence. We'll see off this line out. They have an inside forward inside the backs, resulting in five men defending in the back line. We'll still go there, aiming to get Jamie Roberts or George North, but in this case, it's Daniel Bigger into this 7-10 channel. Now, they knew that Scotland wouldn't commit anyone, just fold forwards around to try and win the race and match the Wales eight. But Wales split their defence, creating channels for a pick and go and Ryan Jones. Alan jones picks up the next one and they approach the 22. It forced pressure and ultimately penalties. When the pressure told and they kicked out, just watch Tim Visser here. He's the winger Af after his kick. He finds himself in an unusual position for a winger. It allows George North on the short side a mismatch with Richie Gray. And he doesn't need a second invitation. Once he's through, Tim Visser misses him and there's no gas man to chase. Should he have passed to Alice Cuthbert? Then maybe yes, he should have. But later on down the line, the Lions in form hooker Richard Hibbard crashes over after the one clean line break in a game. There was concern yesterday when in form captain Ryan Jones left the field, but it brought a new dynamic to the team with both man of the match Sam Warburton on the field and Justin Tipperick causing problems for the Scottish offence. Warburton was back to his physical and dominant over the ball self, winning turnover after turnover in the second half. But just watch when the two of them are on the field together, hunting as a pair. Tipperick going low in the absence of the likes of Dan Lydiard, taking the man to the ground. That allows captain Sam Warburton to get over the ball and steal the ball and win penalties in the second half for Lee Halfpenny to knock over. Justin Tipperick is a huge talent. He gets really low and quick out of the blocks. And it's a real foil for the likes of Sam Warburton, aided by Alan Wynne jones block. And just look here right at the death of the game. His hands are on the ball. Scotland are trying to do everything to, to move him. And it brings huge satisfaction to the rest of the team. Now, with three sevens on our panel tonight and that dynamic on the field, I'm interested to know what they felt of Tipperick and Warburton on the field at the same time. What a day in Wales. I said last week that Wales had the players to cause problems at the breakdown, and boy did Wales turn over England yesterday. In history, the sides are really evenly matched. 56 wins each out of 124 games. But yesterday, it was Wales' biggest ever victory over England. Defence was massive. 12 turnovers, only 5 missed tackles. There were 17 by England. And in the last four games, only 36 points conceded, and there's zero tries in that. There were some massive hits. Richard Hibbert, along with the rest of the players, putting their bodies on the line in the Blitz defence. With the Blitz, you're likely to get some turnovers, interceptions. Dan Bigger in this case, and George North gets away, but only a last gasp ankle tap gets him to prevent another try. Jamie Roberts against Tuolagi. What a matchup, but Jamie had the measure of him. Coming out of the line, taking him low and dumping him. And Mike Phillips was just everywhere. Look at him rip the ball off Jeff Parling here, get down on it, secure the ball, turn the ball over for his team. Not just ripping the ball, holding up Vunny Puller. As you see, waiting for his teammates. We see this from Ireland. It's the choke tackle. A maul ensues. In come the other players. It collapses. And the referee, Steve Walsh, yet again gives the turnover to Wales. Just watch Mike Fuller's reaction. Inspirational, fantastic defensive attitude. Pre-match selection was key. And England's back row was outplayed by Wales. And not just in the turnover stakes. Ball carrying as well. 97 metres combined for Wales. 34 metres from the England contingent. And in missed tackles, England back row, they missed five tackles. Only one from the Welsh contingent. Now that leads to penalties. And with the goal kicking accuracy of Lee Halfpenny and Dan Bigger and the nervousness yesterday of Farrell, only 33%, it resulted in a dominant Wales performance. Here are the tries. Ken Owens ripping the ball. Like we saw with Mike Phillips, it causes trouble at the contest. Here now Mike Phillips, he delays. Mike Brown has a choice to make. He has to buy time because he has a forward inside. A nice early ball from Jonathan Davis. Just look at Alex Cuthbert carrying the ball in the right hand. That allows him to fend off Mike Brown, who goes off too high in his tackle, and he's in for a great score. They kept the score by ticking over. The maturity of Phillips and Bigger showed. They extended their lead with a well-taken drop goal. And just look at that pass from Mike Phillips, and the second one to Lee Halfpenny. It cuts out half of the English line. Some great hands, and just watch here now, Justin Tipperick putting the ball back into two hands, causing problems for Mike Brown again, Barrett is too slow to get there. The deft skills of the open side flanker puts Cuthbert in for his second. 
No, but for a small blip in Paris, Wales's scrum has been imperious. And the pressure they exerted on the England scrum yesterday yielded nine more penalties at scrum time. Both the props will take the plaudits for so should Richard Hibbert. England were clearly wary of the Wales' big hit. Dan Cole, we said last week, was very vulnerable. When in their own half, England are clearly under pressure on their own ball. You see Joe Marla going low here, Adam and Co just going nice and square and straight, running right over the top. Joe Marla was substituted after 44 minutes, an admission surely that they probably got selection wrong. This manifested itself in more and more pressure on the scrums, even when the substitutes came on. And here we see Hooker popping up, Marla going up, Cole going into the hole as we suggested, yet another scrum, and the amazing atmosphere contributed to another Wales penalty.